Hi, this is Josh with Retro TV One Tech, and today we have something very rare and very special to show you. This is the IBM ThinkPad 701C, and it features something no other computer has ever had, the butterfly keyboard. Let me show you how it works. And there you go. Isn't that amazing? The keyboard actually unfolds when you open the laptop and folds back inside again when you close it. It's truly something to marvel at because it's just such an incredible design. I have to be a little bit careful when opening this one because as you can see, the hinge is broken over here on the right, but we will fix that in another video. So let's take a look at that now in reverse as it closes. Now as it closes, you can see the laptop starting to pull the keyboard up and over and it's going to slide it back together and it just closes right down underneath it there. And again, the right hinge is broken, but you get the point and uh, it's just such an incredible thing to behold. So why would IBM add this feature to make this computer truly one of a kind? Why was this necessary back in 1995 when this computer came out? To answer these questions, let's talk about just a little of the amazing history of this machine. Back in the mid-90s, laptop manufacturers had far fewer choices than they do now when choosing a display for their computers. They could do a monochrome display without color in a few different sizes. Or they could do a color LCD display in an 8 or 10 inch size due to the fact that color LCD displays were only available in smaller sizes at that time, since they were so new. This left them with the choice of having a small screen on a larger computer, which obviously looks funny, or they could join in the small sub-notebook craze of the mid-90s and make a smaller laptop that would fit the smaller color LCD displays perfectly. Unfortunately, making a laptop this small required the keyboard to be too small to comfortably type on. Early adopters of these sub-notebooks complained that they were difficult to type on for any extended period of time. So IBM had an idea. What if the keyboard could expand out when the laptop was open to make typing much easier? With that in mind, the IBM 701C with the butterfly keyboard was born. There is much more to this story, and if you're interested, there are a couple fascinating documentaries on this machine right here on YouTube if you want to do a search and learn more. All right, so here it is ready to go. Well, you're gonna try and turn it on and see exactly what happens. I did plug it in, I didn't see any lights or anything come on, but um, you can see keyboard all expanded out there looking fantastic and uh yeah let's just see what happens i'll zoom in on the screen a little bit let's see if we can get anything to happen here there it goes look at that wow second the ram Oh, had a little error in the RAM there. So a couple little error codes there. There we go, I fixed the camera so you can see it a little better. So we have a memory error and a bad CMOS battery. Date and time incorrect. So obviously date and time incorrect caused by the bad battery. So we have the option to hit escape to continue starting. Enter to do configuration or F1 to run diagnostics. Let's see what the configuration does. Okay, so there's no battery in here, so we know that. External power mode, all that stuff is fine. This is the 75 megahertz version of the computer. All that looks good. Oh, it thinks it is a 1984 because of the battery. May 1st, 1984, nice. Okay, volume control. That's kind of interesting. It's a DX4, it's got all the RAM installed, 540 megabyte hard drive. Cool, so everything looks good. It's just got a little memory error, but it should still work with that in mind. So I'm not gonna save any changes because I didn't make any changes. So let's see if we can just start the PC. There it goes, look at that. It's actually working. Oh, wow. Checking for active viruses in memory. Well, I would hope there's no viruses in the computer since it hasn't been used for quite some time, but hey, why not? 
You never can be too careful. So it was obviously set to do a virus scan. And now what is it starting? This is Windows. Windows 3.1. Look at that. There it goes. Perfect. It's got a nice screen. Nice mouse pointer. The only issue is that hinge, which I think we can fix pretty easily. So everything seems to work, even with a little bit of bad RAM. That's awesome. All right, so let's see if some of this stuff works. We'll go over into Solitaire and see if we can get a Solitaire game to run here. There it goes. So the mouse works just fine. Yeah. The little AccuPoint nub or whatever they call it, that seems to work fine. The screen is nice and clear. 640 by 480 resolution, perfect for DOS games, which we will be trying momentarily. All right, let's exit Windows and go out to DOS because, you know, that's where all the fun games run. There we go. Now, it said it was PC DOS, so let's run Command and see what we're looking at. PC DOS 6.3. So I'm used to like MS-DOS 6.22 or something like that, but PC-DOS, that's a new one. And of course, that was what IBM, you know, did. That was IBM's version of MS-DOS, but um, I've just never used PC-DOS before. I don't imagine there's a huge difference, but MS-DOS last major version before Windows was 6.22, and here's 6.30, so I wonder if there's any just small little changes. All right, so everything seems to be working just fine here in the directory. Looks like some scan disk files there. The file 12.chk or whatever, those are scan disk files. Let's see how much memory is free. Oh yeah, we've got 609k free. That's great. Plenty of free memory to run some DOS games. All right, so I'm going to try a little uh, media player here. See if we can play something. Maybe canyon.mid is on here or something. Let's see if we can find something. Ah, there it is, canyon.mid. Let's see if it works. Let's see if I've got volume here. I don't hear any sound. Let me see if I can get the sound working. Yeah, so there's no sound right now. Let me try sound. Just like a Windows sound effect or something. Let's see. Yeah, it's definitely not playing any sound, so I don't know if that's... Speakers are muted somewhere or not working, but definitely no sound for right now. All right, so I got it working through the uh, headphones. So there's Canyon.mid. Might be something wrong with the speakers. So let's take a look at this machine and what came with it. First, I would like to thank our amazing community member David for giving me this amazing machine and taking care of her over the years. I said her because David decided to name her Carla due to the C in the name of this machine, the 701C. We're very fortunate to have the official IBM laptop bag that was made for this machine, as well as all of the accessories that came with it. So let's start out down here with these. These are actually spare batteries, and you can see how they are actually labeled ThinkPad there. Pretty cool. Now, these batteries no longer work, at least that I can tell, uh, but I guess I have heard that you can rebuild them. But you can see this is the official IBM laptop battery, and these are, as you can see, nickel metal hydride batteries, which now we use lithium ion, and a lot of laptops at the time were using lithium ion, but uh, IBM decided to go with the uh, nickel metal hydride, and these have a tendency to leak, uh, just like I'll show you later that it did on this machine uh, quite severely and actually damaged a little bit of the inside so the speaker's not working great and the headphone jack is a little bit messed up. Here's another battery case that came with it and this was one of the batteries that was unfortunately disposed of because it was the one that leaked inside of the machine. All right, so let's open this up. You can see here some of the uh, battery damage in the machine as it was sitting 
in storage. It's pretty common. It is just one of those things that happens with older machines. And you can see up there at the top, there's even ThinkPad branding up there, which is really nice. All right, I flipped it around so that you can see uh, what's inside a little bit better. So this is most of the accessories that came with the machine. You can see there's another battery in here. You can also see there's a port extender. It's actually not a port replicator um, because there actually aren't a lot of ports on the back of this machine. So here's the back of the machine. As you can see, the only port is actually there on the right, and it's a door that's closed. And that's where the port extender goes. So any like PS2, VGA monitor, any of that is on the port extender. So here's the port extender. You can see the IBM branding there. And on this side is where it hooks into the computer itself at that port on the back that I showed you that was closed up. And here are some graphics that show you what all hooks into the back of this. And there's all standard ports back here. Here is a nine pin serial port right here. Parallel port for printers. So yeah, this computer couldn't even hook up to a printer uh, unless it had this port extender on it, which makes sense. You wouldn't have a printer to go most of the time, or if you did, you could bring this with you because obviously it fits in the briefcase. And then you had a headphone and microphone jack, and you had your PS2 keyboard and mouse if you wanted to do that. Um, you know, sometimes uh, the, the, uh, the little mouse nub there um, definitely left a little bit to be desired, so it's nice to have a real mouse. And then here is your power input and VGA for a monitor. So if you wanted an external monitor uh, or to do presentations or anything with this thing, back in the day, you definitely could have done that with this port extender. So pretty cool that this was included. Uh, it's really kind of an essential feature of this machine. And actually, this part flips out, and so it makes another little stand for the laptop to sit on. Uh, it kind of puts it up off the ground a little bit, which is kind of nice. So it tilts it towards the user if you want to do that. And if you look at the place where the port extender was, you can tell it was designed absolutely exclusively for this laptop with all of its features. And another essential feature that was included in this bag is the floppy disk drive. And yes, this laptop does not have a floppy disk drive on the case of the computer itself, like a lot of... Um, other laptops at, in the era did. Of course, sub notebooks, they had to make a lot of compromises. So no ports on the back um, and uh, no floppy disk drive. Now they do have like headphone jack and microphone and things like that uh, on the side of the computer, as well as a uh, modem jack for a phone line. But other than that, all the ports and everything else was external to keep the size of the machine small. And this is a proprietary connector for this floppy disk drive. So you couldn't use just any floppy disk drive on this machine. You had to use this specific IBM floppy disk drive that went with the 701C. So these are very rare and hard to find if they don't come with the machine when you buy one. So I'm very thankful and fortunate to have one. Uh, I do hope it works and we'll check it out here a little bit later. And in this bag was the uh, power adapter. I've already got it plugged in down there, but you can see ThinkPad on there. Just a nice little carrying case uh, for the AC adapter for the computer. Here's a quick look at the AC adapter. You can see again IBM in the back, and it does fold up nice and neat for travel. So this machine was all about travel, and uh, it's just a standard barrel jack here at the other end. And another really cool thing that was included in this bag is this. This is actually an RJ11 telephone cable for connecting your modem to your phone line. You can see it's an RJ11, not an RJ45, because those are bigger. That would be for Ethernet, and this is for phone line, but it's basically just a little cord roller for a telephone cord that you can take with you if you're traveling uh, for business, because again, these laptops were primarily for business. They were uh, way too expensive for the average home user at the time at around $4,000. And also included with this extra cable for a printer. This is a parallel cable, but it actually hooks in to the same place as the floppy disk drive. So it's kind of a multi-IO there. Uh, of course, you wouldn't be able to use the uh, floppy and the printer at the same time unless you were using the port extender down here. So lots of different options, but it's nice, I guess, if you didn't have the port extender or didn't take it with you and you just wanted to take this cable to hook up to a printer, uh, you had that option as well. One more thing I wanted to show you that was this little name tag that came with it. Uh, the leather's kind of disintegrated on this a little bit, but you can see it's got a place for address and everything there, but it says ThinkPad, so well-branded, nice little case that came with it. All right, let's talk about ports a little bit. First of all, if you have your standard power jack, just a standard barrel jack here, then you've got your power switch here, which is just a sliding switch. You just slide it all the way over there to the left. And this next port I talked about a little bit already, 
Uh, it is a combination printer or floppy drive port, and you can kind of see the icon there. I know it's hard to see, it's really small, but uh, that's the connector behind this little door for that. You just use a key or something to pop that open. It's actually pretty tight, so that's a good thing. Here is the RJ11 phone connector to hook up the modem. And here we have, I believe, audio line in. Um, well, actually, this is microphone, this is line in, and this is headphone. Now you can see there's some corrosion there, so definitely uh, the headphone jack's a little bit messed up. Now on the back side of the machine, unlike most laptops of the era, there's only one port on the back. Most laptops of the era had multiple ports on the back, but this one just has the connector for the port extender. It also has the IR um, receiver there if you wanted to hook up an IR peripheral of some kind. I really don't know what you would use for that, so if you know about that, leave a comment and let me know, because I just never really used any IR peripherals when I was doing computers in the mid-90s. But anyway, that is the port extender jack. And on the side, we have uh, the place where the battery was, and you can really see if you look down in there, you can see, uh, it's not going to focus very well, but you can see that there's definitely corrosion and things left by the battery that was left in there. So we're going to have to take this apart, make sure there's no major damage inside. This is the hard drive, and this is uh, two PCMCIA slots. All right, so we're back on a different day. We've had a little bit of a setback. Um, of course, this same error message was displayed last time we powered it on. It went to Windows. Everything was good. But I've noticed that now, after being on for about two or three, sometimes as much as five minutes, the computer just goes to suspend mode or standby mode on its own. I thought it was shutting off, but now I've learned that it actually is going to like a suspend or a standby. And if I hit escape and it starts to load Windows, it immediately goes into that suspend or standby mode. So I'll show you. So I'll hit escape. I've got everything on the floor just because I didn't want to set up the whole table because I'm just kind of doing some quick troubleshooting. But you see if immediately everything's quiet. It goes off. Power indicator goes off. But if I hit FN, which is suspend from standby, you'll see immediately the light comes back on. And the hard drive comes back on. And it starts to load windows. Problem is, the screen doesn't come back on. So this started happening after I noticed that the headphone jack wasn't letting the headphones in all the way. So when I plugged in the headphones, I had these iPhone headphones, uh, you know, just old Apple headphones uh, to plug in there. So I plugged them in and uh, it wasn't going in all the way. I thought, well, that's weird. Um, and it, it, it actually, what I think is there's battery corrosion inside of the headphone jack. I thought that um, cleaning it out would help, but it turns out that the headphone jack is right next to, I've taken this cover off, there's a suspend circuitry down there. So I think what I need to do is take the whole thing apart, clean everything out uh, with some alcohol, and get every get all the battery gunk off of that. Because I think what's happening is when the system warms up, it's, um, it's all of a sudden switching to suspend mode every time it goes to Windows. I'm wondering if it went to DOS, if DOS would not allow that suspend mode. All right, so a little bit of an update. I just showed you how the computer was just kind of randomly um, starting up and shutting down, and it almost felt like it was going to a sort of a suspend mode or something like that. So I thought about maybe the sleep-wake battery, which is right here. And uh, as you can see, the positive lead has actually become disconnected from the battery, which probably means the computer, if this was touching the battery on and off, it may have caused the computer to kind of randomly sleep wake. So we'll see if that works here in just a second. Either way, we are going to completely disassemble this eventually and figure out what needs to be replaced to get this to work. But uh, it's really a pretty good working system. It just uh, is not very stable right now. So we need to clean it up and get all these problems resolved. But we're gonna try and take out this sleep wake battery right here if we can. All right, I got it out, but unfortunately, as I was taking it out, the connector completely disintegrated. Um, it's just really, really old plastic, so I really worked at it very, very um, carefully with this tiny little screwdriver, uh, just trying to gently push it out from both sides, and it just disintegrated. So I knew I was going to have to get a new battery, but I'll have to solder something back together if I want to uh, get that battery to reconnect down there. But anyway, let's see if the computer works now. All right, I'm just kind of working on the floor right now because I just had this idea. So let me see if I can get it to work now. So it should boot up into the normal boot screen, show the RAM errors and all that stuff like it has been doing. 
Oh, the RAM error is gone. That's interesting. Usually has a 201 RAM error up there. That's gone. So I should be able to hit escape to continue to load the system, but we'll see what actually happens. It might go to suspend again. Nope. So that's exactly what it's been doing. So no change in behavior there from removing that battery. Oh, well. Oh, wait a second. I'll even remove the power cord and there is no battery in it. So it has no power. And this is still the official IBM AC adapter. I don't know why, but sometimes I do some of my best work just sitting on the floor. <laughs> so just fun. It's just tinkering. Nothing, nothing too serious or earth shattering. We're going to get this figured out one way or the other. If I have to put a new system board or something and that's what I'll do. But you'll see the screen will come right back on here in just a second. Everything will come on. It'll do the RAM test. Sometimes it'll say the RAM is bad. Sometimes it won't. I don't think that's why it's shutting down though. So there's the RAM error and then it does the battery error. Now with the CMOS battery dead, that means I can't save any settings in the CMOS. So I've tried to disable suspend. If I go into the config utility here, I've tried to disable the suspend mode. I've even disabled audio just in case I accidentally messed up the audio jack by trying to clean it out. I've tried to disable all these things. I've tried to disable suspend on lid close because of course you can see that the, uh, you know, the hinge and everything are broken down here. I did order another piece for this where I'm going to fix the crack here. And I'm going to fix the hinge problem. So all that will be good. Let me turn on the flashlight so you can see a little better. Um, on the back, you can really see where the damage is here with this cracked and everything's in the wrong place. This part's fine, but I did order this back piece here uh, so that that should be good as new pretty soon. So yeah, we're gonna get this thing back in running condition. I think that the key is to take it apart, get all this stuff figured out, and then we'll, uh, you know, we'll go from there. The one thing I did want to show you real quick is that if I do uh, save and exit, it will shut itself down again. But what's interesting is if I hit FN and F1, it'll turn back on and it'll go right back to that configuration screen eventually. I may have to hit it again. So I hit FN, F1, it goes back to that configuration screen. So clearly the computer's still working. Clearly the CPU is still working. Everything's still good. It's just for some reason the computer is being told it needs to suspend. So anyway, uh, I'll come back tomorrow later on after the computer sits all night. I'll show you Commander Keen's working well on here and everything else. I've already got that installed. So I'll show you some games and stuff. And then we will probably do the teardown and uh, complete restoration of this computer in another video. So that'll be a big one. It'll be a big project. And I'm really crossing my fingers and hoping we can get it working because it's just so cool. I mean, this keyboard is just so iconic and so amazing. Well, I just shut the camera off and then all of a sudden it said non-system or disk error and then it just booted. I don't know why. <laughs> it literally just booted. I am completely mystified by what's going on here. I really think the board's just dirty with corrosion and I just need to get in there and clean all the corrosion off of it. That was the weirdest thing ever. Literally, I've just been, I just keep messing with it and it's just still working. Now, the question is, when will it shut down? Well, while it's working, I'm going to go ahead and show you a little Commander Keen. Sorry, I don't have my tripod or anything right now. We're just kind of low-key here just because, I don't know. To me, that's the fun part sometimes about messing with computers. Is not, uh, it's just being kind of informal about it. So, either way, this thing really does work well when it works. <laughs> it's like on Carousel Progress, John says, we do have television when it works. Anyway, all right, let me try Commander Keen. Let's just see if we can get it to low before the computer shuts down. I'm wondering if we've maybe bypassed the time limit now. We'll just see. I'm not going to push anything weird. All right, so we'll just see. Okay, there it is. And this is a 640 by 480 display, so there's no scaling problems. It just works. And we're not going to get any sound on this because the sound is not working. And I think part of the reason is because of all the debris on that part of the board. So, But it is working. You can see. Display looks beautiful. It's playing just fine. Everything looks really nice. So we'll go to new game. Can I go to easy mode? Of course, why not? And there it goes. Commander Keen. Working just fine. So super awesome. And you actually see the screen's really nice. It's scrolling really nicely. I only have one hand to play right now, but scrolling really nicely and just, just actually just working. That's pretty awesome, honestly. So, I'm kind of stoked about that. 
know if I can play this with one hand or not. It, nope, apparently not. <laughs> but it's literally still working. All right, I'm going to try this again. See if I can keep playing this with one hand. And just see if the system continues to run. Because it seems like it's just working now. This is the longest it's run for a while since it started having this issue. I did open that cover and try and move some things around down there, so I may have moved the debris that was causing the, the standby problem, or I thought about closing, trying to close the lid and reopen it, and maybe that would re-enable it. I, I gotta remember what I did in the BIOS back there, but it's still working. Last time I played Commander Keen, I didn't get through the first level without the computer dying. I, I'm confused. But I'm happy. <laughs> I'm a happy confused. Wow. I mean, this game is just working so perfectly. This is the only game I have on here right now because uh, I do have to connect the floppy disk drive and connect things through a floppy disk. That is the only way to get files on and off of this computer right now. And I do have an adapter to copy all the files off of it. Our friend David, who um, gave us this computer, uh, definitely uh, wants some of the old documents and things off of it. And obviously, I'm not going to show any of the documents or anything on the video. But... I'll get those off and send those over to him, and I'll make a backup of the hard drive because it's got all the ThinkPad stuff on it too. So here, let's see if we can get back into, um, let's see if we can get back into Windows real quick without the computer shutting off, and you get to watch while it does that. Actually, what's interesting is I've also noticed, you know, the case is broken. I've noticed that right now uh, I've got the screen more vertical, which makes it harder for me to see. I wonder if that's keeping everything off of the suspend switch. Let's go back into Windows. This is the longest it's worked the whole time. It's just working. This is why computers are fun and frustrating at the same time, because you just don't know why something works sometimes. So this is cool. I wanted to show you this real quick. ThinkPad. So it's got, let me make this bigger here. I love Windows 3.1. It's been so long. So this is a kind of a cool thing. There's online book, README, comfort and productivity, PC card director, but Disket Factory is really cool, and this is why I want to back up this hard drive. Look at that. You can make diskettes for PC DOS. You can make diskettes for Windows 3.1. Like I want to make Windows 3.1 disks. Um, I want to make you know disks for the drivers and things. This is just super super cool. So, and again, the computer is continuing to work. There's been no other issues. So I am just really flabbergasted by this. I really don't want to touch it, but it's still working. <laughs> One thing I want to try real quick is maybe restarting it, but I'm kind of scared to do it. I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to just let it run for a little while and see what happens. And I, I'm just going to mess with Windows a little bit and see, you know, if, if it resets itself or if it goes to suspend mode. Because right now it seems really stable. Well, everybody, Eureka, I figured it out. I am so excited. I've been working on this for a few days now. Um, and I just can't believe I figured it out. It really was the computer forcing itself into standby, but it actually wasn't the dirty contacts and things down there. That still does need to be cleaned. It wasn't the corrosion. Um, it was, and that was just a screensaver, but it was this back here. Let me turn on the flashlight so you can really see right here. If you can see, um, the, um, the hinge is broken right here the hinge is broken those screws are supposed to be facing down luckily i ordered a whole new piece that goes in here the plastic just got old it cracked the hinge got too tight i'm going to take it all apart i'm going to relube the hinges and make sure they're moving better and replace the plastic here but this piece right here is connected to a switch that when it is pushed down too far uh, it thinks the laptop is closed so i got my fingernail in there and pushed it back this way as far as i could go without feeling like i was going to break anything more uh, and the computer turned right back on on its own. That's what it is. It's the hinge. So I just need to wait until the lid piece, this is this whole lid piece that says ThinkPad on it and everything. This whole lid piece is coming in. It was only 20 bucks at a parts store I found online. So once that's, this is all one piece here. So once that comes in, I should be able to fix it all, uh, get all that corrosion cleaned up inside while it's all taken apart. And this thing should be good as new. That is exciting. So I actually got the speaker working a little bit better. It seems to be working better the more I use it. Huh. 
Almost like it just needed some power to run through it, so that's kind of cool. So I decided to go ahead and pop the hard drive out of the computer just to make sure I have the data backed up on it. You can see it's in this little hard drive caddy. I used just a little metal tool to just gently pry it out of the system. It came right out. It's got some torque screws here that I'll have to take out in order to get the hard drive out because this is a proprietary connector. But I did get this adapter uh, to be able to connect it to my modern PC so I can back up all the data on it. The computer is not working again this morning just because um, I think that the lid is actually um, popped back into the wrong place. So I just really have to leave it alone and start getting it replaced. But either way, I know it works. So once the screws are out, the hard drive's free, but I still can't quite get it out of here because it's got this big sticker all around it. So I really don't want to take the sticker off, but um, I guess I may have to in order to get this out of here. So I may have to uh, kind of figure out what all this says. Do not push cover. All right, so I was able to gently peel off the sticker here. And uh, then I was able to remove the cable, revealing a normal 44-pin interface that I should be able to plug into my computer. All right, so I've got it all plugged in, and the good news is it actually works in the computer. And here you can see the directories on the disk. So I am going to be archiving all of those to protect them for later. So now I have the floppy disk drive connected. Let's see if it works. We're going to test it out on Silverball. Let's see what happens here. It's really cool that I still have the original Silverball that I bought a long time ago. All right, so let's hit A. We'll see if it works. Oh, I hear something. Yes. Okay, let's see if it'll give me a directory. Yeah, the disk drive works. That's awesome. So I said earlier, these disk drives are really, really rare. So the fact that the disk drive works is a really good thing. Let's see if we can install Silverball here. Sorry about the banding on the screen. It's really hard to film some of these LCDs on these monitors. There, that's better. For some reason, when I use the zoom lens on this camera, it doesn't seem to band quite as badly, but let's go ahead and press any key, press any key, drive C, directory silver, go for it. Seems to be working perfectly. Now, of course, once this is finished, we won't hear the sound on the game. The speaker is working, but it's really, really, really quiet. So, but we'll definitely be able to load the game. All right, files are copied and we'll select our sound card. Now this one has a Sound Blaster Pro compatible chipset. It's an ESS audio drive, I believe, and it's all standard IRQ7, DMA1, all the things, port 220, and save. All right, let's see if we can get this thing to play Silverball. Yeah, there we go. Loads right up. Of course, we can't hear it. Let me try turning it up and just see what happens. I still don't hear it, but that's okay. Yeah, it looks fantastic. So this screen is 640 by 480 in resolution, which means that DOS games run perfectly on it because DOS games were mostly at the resolution of, of 320 by 240. So 640 by 480 is exactly double of that. And that makes it really, really nice to play games on. There's no black bars or anything. A lot of laptops had 800 by 600 or uh, 12, 1024 by 768, which is great for Windows, but not so great for DOS. And what would happen a lot of times, ooh boy, that was, that was good, I think. So what would happen a lot of times, oh, there I got like 2 million points. Ooh, another two million. Nice. Well, what happened a lot of times is you'd get those black bars all around the screen because the laptop just couldn't do any type of uh, scaling. CRT monitors do scaling just fine. So that was just a problem with early laptops with DOS games. So the great news is everything works on this laptop except the hinge, which we're going to fix, and the speaker which I think we can fix by cleaning out the inside and making sure everything is plugged in securely and all that. So a lot of great things on this. And uh, overall, I'm very, very pleased with this machine. And I think that I'm going to have a lot of fun with this over the years once I get everything fixed up nicely. Well, that's all for now for this first look at the IBM ThinkPad 701C, the butterfly keyboard. 
We hope you enjoyed the video. Remember to leave a like, comment, subscribe, all those things, but also definitely stay tuned for the next part where we do a restoration of this because as you can see, the hinge is really messed up. Uh, there's a lot of broken plastic and I did order a lid replacement for this computer. Pretty amazing that I found a supplier that still had a lid for this machine available. I was super thankful for that. So I'm gonna be doing a full disassembly of this machine, cleaning out all the battery corrosion and everything else, just making sure everything's in tip top shape so that Carla here uh, can have a much longer rest of her life here playing retro games and all kinds of fun. And uh, I'm just excited to use this machine more and more, especially after the hinge is fixed so that I can open and close it and watch this amazing keyboard uh, go back and forth and uh, open and closed all the time. So definitely stay tuned for the restoration video on this. Um, and I hope you enjoyed this part. Leave a comment if you have one of these or if you saw one of these or if you're just amazed and had never seen anything like this before. I'd love to know all those things in the comments down below. All right, everybody. So for now, enjoy that tech and keep it retro.